that cannot be tamed you are the power in our veins our lord our god we are more than conquerors through christ you have overcome this world this life we will not bow in order to shame we are defiant in your name you are the fire that the power in our veins, our Lord, our God, our conqueror. I 
the power of our God. And almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. So when I fight. Bethany. Uh, my name is Daniel. I'm, I work in children's ministry here at, uh, at Bethany, uh, mainly with elementary school kids downstairs. Uh, just wanted to invite everybody to take a moment to uh, greet the people next to you if you're here in the room. If you're joining us online, just uh, you know, in, in the chat or whatever, just uh, say hello. So uh, thank you for being here. Happy to see you. Okay, everyone, if you can take a minute to uh, get back to your seats and we'll get started here. In the meantime, I do want to highlight uh, our connection card that's on the, on the chair in front of you. Uh, or if you're online, there are options online to fill that out as well. You know, just to get contact information for you or, uh, you know, if you want to update, if, even if we have your contact information, updates on that or if there's something you'd like us to pray for or anything like that. So feel free to use that. Let me actually grab the rest of my notes here. Okay. Uh, as far as announcements, I uh, do want to highlight the, the, you know, the Christmas 
of course, Christmas is upcoming, right? And just our, our service situation for that. So on Christmas Eve, we'll be having a, a Christmas Eve service uh, in here in, at 6 p.m. Uh, that evening. But of course, Christmas Day this year is on a Sunday. Uh, so we will be having just a virtually o virtual only option at our, our uh, normal 10 a.m. Uh, time, but only virtual. So don't be here. Uh, spend the time with your families and, and tune in and uh, hopefully join in the chat like those that are doing so right now. Uh, another Christmas announcement, we have uh, probably saw on the way in just outside the, the sanctuary door, the uh, Giftmas tree, a little Christmas tree there with some tags on it. Those tags all have, uh, so it's, it's, it's gifts for, for local, local children, and so each one has like an age of a child, a gender, and a little bit of information. So you can take one of those tags if you like, uh, purchase that gift, you know, choose it on your own, and uh, wrap it, and then connect that tag back to the outside and bring it in here by next Sunday, the, the 18th, and we'll, we'll get those uh, uh, to the, the appropriate people, the pr appropriate children, I should say. Uh, another Christmas thing, uh, wrapping event. So the Laurel Volunteer Rescue Squad is doing a toy wrapping, an annual toy wrapping event. We've been involved in this before, but that's going to be next Sunday at noon at the Laurel Firehouse on Cherry Lane. So if you're looking to help out with, with wrapping toys uh, for children, uh, go, you, you can get involved in that. All the supplies will be included, so you can uh, you know, just bring yourself right and help out with that. If you want any more information on either the gift mystery or the, the wrapping event, feel free to talk to Sherry B. Craft. Uh, she, she knows all about those things. Uh, we may have other announcements on, online, right? Go to uh, bethanyorlaurel.org announcements, slash announcements. So, uh, more information there occasionally, so feel free to be checking that. Excuse me. Uh, so now we're going to move on to the part of our service where we get to, to celebrate uh, our, our, our opportunity to give back to God with our, our resources, right? So we're going to be doing our, our giving. I believe we'll have a slide up here, right? Yep. So uh, many different ways to give to, to Bethany and, uh, you know, help to support the things that you see going on here in the room as well as the, the things that we're involved in in the community. So... Uh, we thank you for that, and um, I'll take a moment now to pray for that offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you, uh, as, as always, that, that we get to be here and we get to celebrate you, whether here in person or online, uh, and just the things that you're doing, again, here in the room and across the community because of, of Bethany. So uh, we just want to take this opportunity to pray over the, the offering the, again, opportunity that we have to give back some of the resources that you've given to us uh, for you to use to your glory. And um, we, we offer that up to you, and we, we thank you once again, and we pray that you use those things to, to um, better your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, so we'll take another moment and get back into worship uh, before we hear a message from uh, Pastor Nate. Thank you very much. Jesus, wake me from my sleep. Father, come, breathe breath in me. I'm in the shadow of your wings, overcome by everything. I need your hand, your touch on me. My heart is yours, come search and seek. Take the wicked out of me and redeem me with your truth. Overcome by all you do, my every breath I give to you. I surrender. I surrender all, my hands are reaching out, my heart proclaims you now. I surrender, I surrender all, my hands are reaching out, my heart proclaims you now. Jesus, wake me from my sleep. Father, come, breathe breath in me. I'm in the shadow of your wings, overcome by everything. 
I need your hand, your touch on me. My heart is yours. Come search and see. Take the wicked out of me and redeem me with your truth. Overcome by all you do. My every breath I give to I surrender all, my hands are reaching out, my heart proclaims you now. I surrender, I surrender all, my hands are reaching out, my heart proclaims you now. And I surrender, I surrender all, my hands are reaching out. My heart proclaims you now, I surrender, I surrender all, my hands are reaching out, my heart proclaims you now,
Father, we thank you. We thank you for another chance to give you glory. Another chance to sing your praise. Lord, we thank you for life. We thank you for just the ability to wake up and to come together. But most, Lord, we thank you for your son. So Lord, today as we gather, I pray that you might have your way. That you might touch your people. That you've prepared the hearts. That you've prepared the word. And that all that I might say might serve your will. Lord, where I am weak, be strong. Where I am fast, slow me down. And where I am unclear, bring clarity. In Jesus' name we pray and give you thanks. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, Bethany. <laughs> um, before I get into the message, I want to add something on to the announcements that you've already gotten. Uh, you heard about the gifts that are being set up that we want to be able to do for the community. But I want to be clear that sometimes, even in the house of God, there are people who have need. And if that's you, this is, you can uh, get with Sherry B. Craft. It will be confidential. But we want to make sure that even the kids who are in the house don't go without as well. Amen? Amen. So if you know somebody or you are somebody, don't, don't think any kind of way about it. See me, uh, see Sherry, so that we can make sure that everybody is kept. Amen? Turn with me, if you will, to John, the Gospel according to John, chapter 3, as I try to close out this series on following the way with this week's message being the eternal way. If you haven't been with us for the last few weeks, I started off in, in the first week of this series talking about preparing the way, and we looked at um, John the Baptist and how he prepared the people for the coming of the Messiah. But of course, if we're going to prepare the people today for the return of the Lord, then we need to know who he is. So we talked about knowing the way. And we went further into John's gospel, talked about Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through him. Well, this, today I want to talk about the eternal way. And I want to go to a passage that most of us may have heard at one time or another. And I'm actually going to read verses 1 through 21, and I'm going to talk through all of it. Because I want to do it in context and hopefully do it justice so that we have a fuller understanding of the eternal way that leads to salvation and to the kingdom of God. Amen? So I'm reading from the English Standard Version, and I'm picking up in verse 1. And here the Bible says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not, mar do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I had told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light 
lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that they may be clearly seen and his works have been carried out in God. When we look into the gospel according to John, John presents Jesus in a way that is different than both Matthew's gospel and Mark's. Matthew lays out the genealogy. He's pointing out the fact that Jesus is the lineal Messiah. He is, he's fulfilled the requirements by his lineage to be the Messiah. When we look at Mark, he didn't even start with that because he's talking to a people group or the gospel is going to a people group that don't necessarily care much for that lineage. But when we get to John, John began chapter 1 by laying Jesus as the coming of God in the flesh. He says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He lays out that all things that came into being came into being through him, and nothing that is came without him. If you were to read chapter, that first chapter, you come down to verse 14, and it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. I think it's fitting that as I'm closing this chapter, we're in the season of Advent, where we're really marching toward when we celebrate the birth of Jesus. And here, this is how John lays him out. This is how he presents him. If you were to come through chapters 2, you'll see that Jesus does some things that ruffle some feathers. In chapter 2, right before we get to chapter 3, he cleanses the temple. It's one of my favorite sayings because when people ask me, what would Jesus do? Sometimes jokingly, I say it's quite possible he'd make a whip and beat everybody. Because he turned over the tables because of what was happening in the temple. They were, had false weights and measures when people would come to exchange in order to do sacrifices. And Jesus went off. He didn't just walk in and say, you know, bless you. Jesus went full-blown Jesus. But then after that, Jesus does some things, and the people see him doing miracles. And, and he, the Bible says he didn't entrust himself to them because they weren't, pretty much they weren't in right of heart. But then we arrive in chapter 3. And we see this man Nicodemus arrive, and Nicodemus is no small figure. They, the Bible cl uh, calls him a leader of the Jews. He was a wealthy man. He was a known man. He was a well-learned Pharisee. He might not have had much issue with what Jesus had just done in the temple. Can I treat for a minute? In this day, they had various sects, S-E-C-T-S. And with one of those were the Pharisees, another were the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees largely operated in the temple. So what Jesus has just done in chapter 2 would have been highly problematic for them. But for the Pharisees, they didn't operate as much in the temple. That wasn't their issue. So they wouldn't have been as concerned. In fact, they might have felt a little bit good that their opposition got, uh, opposition got knocked down a little bit. But here Nicodemus comes, this teacher among teachers, he was a part of the Sanhedrin, the group of those leaders of the people, and he comes to Jesus by night. And some people will look at this, and, and different theologians have analyzed this differently. Some say he came by night because he didn't want to be seen by other people coming to ask Jesus questions. Some say he wanted uninter um, uninterrupted conversation. Because when Jesus taught in the day, there were normally crowds around, so there was this exchange going on, but if you wanted an in-depth conversation— you might try to get him alone. Now, I need to clarify something because we read this as though it's just Jesus and Nicodemus. The Bible doesn't actually tell us that. In fact, it's more likely that his disciples were present. But here Nicodemus comes, and he comes and he approaches Jesus. And when he does so, uh-oh, when he approaches Jesus, he comes to him with platitudes. He acknowledges him. So a teacher acknowledging a teacher. He, say, he calls him rabbi, which means teacher. So he's endearing himself to a dialogue with Jesus. And when he comes in and lays it out in that format, he's trying to get through the pleasantries, but he has a real question that Jesus just skips over the platitudes and jumps right into. He's clearly coming for knowledge. He's clearly coming for truth. He's seen the miracles. He says, clearly you must, God must be with you because of what you're doing. Underneath that is that statement of, well, well, wait, who are you? How do you do this? Because we can't do this. And what is it that we don't know that you do? Now, he never says this, but watch how Jesus responds to him. And if you're taking notes and you're wondering what the first point is, it's quite simple, and it is what Jesus tells him. And that is that we must be born again. We must be born again. If we really want to see the kingdom of God, we must be born again. And I'm going I'm to have to do some theology this morning because of that. You see this in verse 3. Jesus answered him, is what the Bible tells us. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, I, I want you to catch this because th 
No question to that effect has been actually verbally asked. Jesus, knowing what the real issue was, that he needed truth, Jesus gives him truth. But in doing so, he absolutely washes away a lot of the thought process that Nicodemus has. Let me show you just a little bit more. I'm going to go right through verse 8 in this section. Because Nicodemus says to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter for a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answers, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. That which is born flesh is flesh, and that which is born spirit is spirit. I want to stop there because there's some things here that um, we may not catch when we look at translations. You see, when, he, when Jesus says that one must be born again, we think as in a repeated act, which is one meaning of the word. But if I actually went into the underlying language, it also means to be born or conceived from above. So what he's saying is that spiritually you must be reborn by a supernatural act of the Holy Spirit. This is a problem for the Pharisees who did a lot of work-based things where we meet the requirements of the law and therefore we're going to see the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus says, no, you have to be born again and it has to be a spiritual rebirth. Some of us operate much like the Pharisees. We check boxes. We, we think that by doing more or saying more or seeing ourselves in a spiritual fashion, we somehow are going to earn our way into the kingdom. But this is exactly what Jesus dispels. He says, no, wait a minute. He says, that which is flesh is flesh. That which is spirit is spirit. What he's saying is your flesh will never evolve into spirit. Your works won't make you more spiritual. Your, your belief that you're better than somebody or you're going to check the boxes and you're going to dot every I and cross every T don't make you spiritual. The, the, the really religious word for it is called regeneration. It's a recreating of you by the Holy Spirit. This is why some of us don't understand how we went. Well, let me fix it. I'll just say me. All of me went from being somebody who was highly temperamental, highly passion, go clean, all be ready to fight, to sometimes I'm operating in grace that my wife will look at me and say, who are you? And I look at her and say, I don't know. Because <laughs> a part of me still wants to be that, but what's happening is that the Holy Spirit works in a way that I can't explain. There are times where I don't function the way I used to function. And it's not because I could have worked myself out of it, because honestly, I want to work myself into it sometimes. If we're honest, everybody, anybody in here, can somebody talk to me that ever wanted to be mad and wanted to go off and God didn't let you? I like this side of the room. I'm just turn this way. But here Jesus lays that out. He says, hey, if you want to see the kingdom, you got to be born again. And it's interesting because right here, the teacher of the people, this religious leader, looks at Jesus and he does what we do when we don't understand something. We go to what we know. And he says, wait a minute, you mean to tell me I'm old? How am I supposed to climb back inside now? Now, I bet you every woman that could have been present for this conversation, if they had been there, would have looked at Jesus and said, yeah, please answer this. He says, can I, get, can I go for a second time and be born from my mother's womb? And Jesus looked at him and says, if I can't take, if you don't believe what you've seen in earthly things in me, no wonder you don't understand these spiritual matters. Now, I'm paraphrasing and flipping it, but that's the inference what he gives them as to what he says to him. He says, how is it that you're the teacher and you don't understand these things? I'm telling you what I know, and you don't believe what you've seen, and therefore you also don't believe what I've said. You don't believe our testimony because it goes against what you've been taught. And some of us have just been taught wrong, not intentionally, but by someone's ex um, their actions. We taught our kids that it was okay to tell a lie by telling them that it was a white lie and it was okay. So when they got older and they told big lies, they wonder why there's a distinction. Some of us have told people that if you just do, if you check all the boxes, somehow that makes you religious and that makes you spiritual and that makes you godly. No, it makes you look religious and it makes you look spiritual. But unless you're born again, unless you submit your will to God, unless you give yourself to him, you have not been born again. You can come to church every day. The Pharisees were going together every, every day or so often. The Sadducees were doing violations of God's word in the temple. And Jesus said, wait a minute, all your works mean nothing. You've got to be born again. And that's what I say to us. As we look for the eternal way, the first thing is we've got to be born again. Can we say born again? The next thing I want to give you in, in this context is this. And I only want you to be born again, but how do we go about that process? Is that we must believe for salvation. Can we say believe? 
Look at verse 9. I'm going to go through 9 through verse 15 for this. Nicodemus then responds after Jesus tells him that he must be born of the Spirit. He says, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now check this out, because this is where we normally make the disconnect. We all have read John 3, 16, but watch what Jesus is saying here. Most of us have seen, a, well, I hope we've all seen one, seen the, um, the fire, the, the ambulance. Everybody seen the ambulance before? You see that pole on the ambulance with a snake around it? This is where it comes from. We don't even realize how much of our Bible is in our daily life. But when we look at this, what happens is he tells him, he says, listen, as, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man, the Son of Man being a title that Daniel uses when he um, points to the coming of the Messiah in his return, he says he must be lifted up in the same way. Now let me show you why I made the statement so that no one says we're just making stuff up. I didn't get it to them, so I'm going to read this to you. When Jesus makes that, that reference point, he's making it to a religious leader. So in the context, it's like me, if I were a police officer, going to Chris and making a reference that Chris just knows. Or me going to Brooke and making an actor recommend um, statement and she just knows. Y'all follow me? But sometimes we don't just know. So let me take you, I'm going to show you something in Numbers chapter 21, picking up in verse 4. And I'm going to go through verse um, 9. You don't have to turn it, but I you can write this down. Here, G the Lord has just given a victory to the children of Israel. Because a, a, group, a people group attacked them and took captives, they went to the Lord and said, if you'll give us them into our hands, we'll utterly blot them out. So then we get down to verse 4 in Numbers 21, and here's what the Bible says. From Mount Or, they set out by the way of the Red Sea. To go around the land of Eden, Edom, and the people came in, and became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and there is no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he, that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Now watch this in verse 8. In verse 8, the Bible says, and the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if the serpent bit anyone, he would look up at the bronze serpent and live. Now check this out. The same, the same thing that was given as a judgment of the people and their rebellion is the, is the remedy for their issue. So when he says this, what he says is, hey, listen, the Son of Man is coming, and he's going to have to be lifted up in front of the people. And for them to, to receive the salvation that he comes to bring, they're going to have to believe in him. In the same way that people who had been bitten by snakes and were on their deathbed had to believe enough to look up at a bronze serpent on a snake, on a pole. And they saw what the response was then. They did it and they lived. Jesus said, they'll look to me and they'll have eternal life. So when he makes the statement, it's not an abstract statement. He's talking to someone who would have known the history of the people. And he says, the reason you're alive is because someone in your line believed. And now for people to have eternal life, they're going to have to believe in the same way in me. And then he goes beyond that. 
And, and so that's, there's the first, that's the second point, I'm sorry, that we must believe for salvation. If you don't believe, it's just not for you. And I'm not saying it like it shouldn't be for you. I'm saying without belief, many of the people died. Y'all saw that when I read it in the Bible, right? There are people today who are dying eternally because they have not believed. And so we must be born again, but our path to that is that we must believe in Christ. Amen? The last thing I want to give you on the back of that is this. I want to dispel a rumor that Jesus came to judge us. Now, it's a little nuance. But my third point, if you're taking notes, is this. That our belief frees us from condemnation. Our belief. Now, you can put some brackets in here because I don't want nobody to say I just said whatever you believe frees you. Our belief in Jesus frees us from condemnation. Check this out in verse uh, 16. Before I read it, I want to give the, the brackets around this. You just heard that in verse 15, Jesus told them what must happen. When we get to verse 16, it's really the why. Verse 16 begins with a conjunction. It's connecting what comes with what was. So I've got to go to the cross is what Jesus is foreshadowing. And here's why I have to do it, because God loves you. Pick up in verse 16. Here's what it says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whosoever believes, or whoever believes in him, should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. Check this out. This is where the nuance comes in. The fact that Jesus had to come says we were already judged. The fact that he had to come is pointing out a problem. But God says, and we see this in this dialogue that Jesus is having with Nicodemus, he says, listen, just like Moses lifted up a serpent in the wilderness and those people looked upon it and, and lived, I'm going to have to go to a cross. And when I do that, the people are going to believe in me and they will live. Because God loves the world, everybody in it, so much that he's already prepared a remedy for the judgment that we've earned. So he says, hey, for God so loved the world, he sent his only son. In this case, Jesus is talking about himself. And he says that whoever believes in him will not perish. Now, some of us look at this and think perish means we're just going to die. Y'all want to know a secret? Unless God comes back first, all of us will physically die. We, we agree with that, right? All right. Parish here is talking about a spiritual death. It means that after we close ours on this side, if we have not placed our faith in Jesus, there's a spiritual eternity too. And he said, if you want life on this side, it comes through Jesus. But then he goes on, and here's what he says after that. He says, for another conjunction, God loved you. Be I got to die because God loved you. And, he, and because he loved you, he didn't send me to judge you, that's the other word for condemned. If you see it, it's judge you. Even though Jesus is the judge in the last day, he says, I'm in verse uh, 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is already condemned. Check this out. That word condemned, he says, you already got judgment coming. Now, I don't want to simplify, but part of me is like, what you got to lose? You've already lost. We've already lost. Sin has already entered the world. We're already under condemnation without Christ. And he says, God didn't send me to instill condemnation. I'm here to revoke it. I'm here to take the penalty for it. I'm here to step into the place that sin has caused you to be in so that you won't have to go through it. And it's this simple, that you might put your faith in me. And some of us need to catch this because some of us have been trying to check boxes our whole lives. And we wonder why we're still wrestling in our faith. Possibly, is it, is it possible that in the striving to meet people's expectations of what you should look like, you haven't surrendered yourself to what God said? I will say that at some point in all of our lives, we've wrestled with this. Because somebody told us, you got to do this to be saved. You got to do that to be saved. And what he said was, believe. 
And that's why today I, I wanted to close with this series in this way, because I want us to realize that as we're going to celebrate the birth of Jesus, understand that he was born for this reason. He came into the world to free us from the very condemnation that sin wrought. And then he laid it bare in his word. And if there's anybody here or online who has gone to church your whole life, or maybe it's your first time in church, and you're looking at this saying, wait a minute, I didn't realize it was that simple. Well, I'm glad to be the first to let you know it's that simple. There are things that come beyond that in how we should live in accordance with what we believe, but your salvation comes from faith in God, and that faith is through his son. Amen? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for its clarity that you sent your son for us. I thank you that you made the path of reconciliation seamless in Jesus. I thank you that even as now we march toward a day when we acknowledge Christ's birth, I thank you that by his death we have the possibility of rebirth. That we might be recreated, that we might be remade, refashioned, even in all of our imperfections, in all the ways we struggle, in all the ways we missed it. I thank you that you sent your son, that by placing our faith in him, he might wash all of that away. And Lord, I thank you that while we are still not perfect, we are preserved. So that I pray for any person in this room or online who does not have a relationship with you, who has not placed their faith in Jesus, that today might be the day, two weeks from Christmas, that we might celebrate together their rebirth. That they might place their faith in you. That they might believe in the only Son of God who came from heaven down to earth, who lived and taught and died and rose so that we might be reborn. Lord, I pray for the person who is saying, I need you right now. I pray that you might meet them where they are, that even as I pray that they might confess with their mouths the Lord Jesus and believe in their hearts that all that what I just said is true, that he did come for them, live for them, die for them and rose for them. And that one day he'll return for us all. Lord, I pray for the person who has once walked in the faith but walked away feeling like they couldn't keep up. Lord, I pray that this word reminds them that their faith in Jesus is enough. And if they will walk in that faith, that you will work out the rest. That you will continue the growth and that the change on the inside will become evident on the outside. But Lord, that the criteria is quite simple. Belief in you. And Lord, I pray for the person who doesn't have a, a family around them, a church home, a group of people who are diligently seeking you who place their faith in you, their hope in you. I pray, Lord, that if this is the place you've brought them to, that we might connect and be one body, imperfect in all its ways, but preserved by all your glory, so that we might all continue to grow in our relationship with you, in our understanding of you, and in our transformation by you. So, Lord, I thank you for all these things, and I pray it over the people in the room and online. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If that's you and you're in the room and you have any questions about salvation, you need prayer, um, or maybe you want to know more about this church, one of the elders, I'm one of them there, I see there are several of us here, will be in the front and we'd love to talk to you, pray with you, and make sure that you don't leave here with questions unanswered. And if you're online, connect with us, hit a connect card, send us your prayer request, let us reach back out to you so that we might truly walk with you as one body in Christ. And may the Spirit of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide, cover, and keep every single one of you. God bless you. Have a great day.